Good morning, true crime friends. How you doing? You know I love a verdict. I love a closing statement. And today we have both. Okay, look, we are talking um, the state of Florida versus Wade Wilson. Look, I have done three videos on this guy. So go back if you missed the first two so you know what happened. Today, we are going to talk closing statements. But first, don't forget to like this video and subscribe to the channel. So the state gets up there, right? And the state is like, okay, so look. We've been here for three days. We just started this case the other day and you know everything what had happened. He met some ladies at a bar and um, he was getting freaky and friendly with one three seconds after he met her. No judge, not that much judgment, a, a little bit of judgment. I have a little bit of judgment, but both of them truthfully, because ma'am, you didn't even know this dude's real name and you was just like doing the whatever. You was doing the most with him. Anyway, so, okay, but these are grown folks. They did what they're going to do. And um, they were drinking and they were doing some light narcotics and having a really, really good time. And then he unfortunately unalived her like strangers are sometimes wont to do. And so then he left her house and he was going to wrap her up in blankets and throw her in the trunk of the car. But then the rigor mortis had set in and he couldn't get her in the trunk of the car because he couldn't fold her. Who couldn't? Or if he had folded her sooner, I don't listen. I don't know how unalive and transporting bodies works. And um, I really, really do not hope to find out more about that. So he stole the lady's car. He stole her phone because he lost his own phone. So he's like, boop, 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 boop. hello, girlfriend. Oh, yeah, he had a girlfriend. So he called his girlfriend. and He was like, listen, um, I need to meet with you. And so she was like, where are you? What's happening? Meet me over at my spa. Let me tell you something. Miss Mila of Mila Spa, that's the girlfriend. Mila got on the stand. It has been five years since this case. And she's like, this is the best free advertisement I am ever, ever going to get for my spa. So if you took a drink or a shot or did squats every time she said Mila Spa, you would be in excellent shape. You'd have a nice behind or you would be really, really drunk. Because she was like, Mila Spa, Mila Spa. If you Google it, you can still find Mila Mila Spa. I am on Google. I have excellent reviews. I was like, Mila, calm down. This is a murder trial. Not time for you to advertise your business. Also, I let my Google fingers do the walking and she does have excellent reviews and her prices seem fair. Anyway, also the next time I'm in Lee County, I might drop on by Mila Spa just to say like, hey, Mila girl, how you doing? So anyway, Mila told us all about her spa and he pulled out her weave. So he was charged with the unfortunate unaliving of the first lady, crimes against Mila's weave. And then after he roughed up Mila's weave, he was driving over to someplace else, Lord only knows where. And he just saw a random lady on the street. He lured her into the car and then was driving down the street and also hugged her real tight on her neck until she could no longer breathe. Sadly, um, he like, he, she didn't die right away. She just sort of like passed out. He put her in a sleeper hole because, you know, he was, he didn't want to be too distracted. He felt confident that um he could drive and choke, but not drive and choke all the way out. He could drive and choke until you passed out. And so finally he was like, dang, she's not slipping the surly bonds of this earth fast enough. So he threw her on the ground and then ran her over with the car. It was a terrible, terrible situation. And the state was like, he's terrible. I'm telling you right now, you should convict him. And they sit out. The defense got up. Now, listen, the defense failed to cross-examine most of these witnesses. And I was like, defense, are y'all just wall decoration? What are y'all doing? So the defense attorney got up and he did an admirable job. I guess, if you could call it that, he was like, okay, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, these women are no longer on this mortal coil. And I was like, sir, sir, uh, um, okay. He's like, but it was not premeditated. Really now? He's like, he was in the heat of passion. He wasn't doing light narcotics. He was doing heavy narcotics. He was taking Flocka. I was like, wait, who's Flocka? What's Flocka? I never heard of Flocka. And so the state pops up and they're like, objection. And I was like, oh, well, they have, and the judge granted it. It was like, mm -mm, facts, not in evidence. They never said anything about Flocka during, um, the whole case, but so now they can't bring it up. And I was like, first of all, that means I need to know every single thing about Flocka. So I was like, okay, hello, Google. Uh, you know, the former 411 operators that now work down there at Google. I was like, hey, 411, 
What's flaca? What does it mean? Also, doesn't flaca mean skinny in Spanish? What what is happening? Turns out, flaca is a is a is bath salts. Which it took me a long time to understand that bath salts was not just like the cow gone take me away kind of stuff, but it was like a, a narcotic that people do and it makes their brain crazy. But before he was objected to, the defense attorney was like, "That stuff is bad. Puts holes in your brain." And I was like, "Really?" Um, I think he got more than holes. Like they made him take it out half of it or something. The flock eat it up, child, unclear. So then the defense attorney goes on and says, what he did was second degree, unfortunate, unaliving, not first degree. It was a crime of passion. And I was like, sir, you're not helping. Maybe sit down. Cause I don't, I don't, I, I, I don't think you're helping your client. He's like, is he depraved? Yes. Is he a sicko? Absolutely. But in our defense, oops, he was whacked out on Flocka. He, he committed burglary. He committed second degree unfortunate unaliving, not first degree unfortunate unaliving. And I was like, how is this a defense? I do not understand. Clearly, his attorneys don't like him that much. And I was just like, I don't, I don't understand the method to this madness. And then it occurred to me, they know this dude is going to get convicted, right? Because he confessed on tape to the police, to his daddy, to anybody who would listen. He confessed a lot. But since the state is seeking the unalive penalty, then I think that the defense is like, yeah, we know he's going to be convicted. What we're trying to do is to keep him off that unalive row over there. And I was like, oh, so they can concede a whole bunch of stuff along the way. Listen, that lady prosecutor got up. She was having none of it. Not a bit. She was like, do you know the mosquito theory? And I was like, no, girl, tell me every single thing about the mosquito theory. So look, the mosquito theory of premeditation is this. If you sit there minding your own business and you see a mosquito fly by, you look and you're like, oh, a mosquito. And then you whack it. That's premeditation. You premeditatedly, uh, you first degree unalive that mosquito because you had a time to like stop recognize it was a mosquito and then smack it because you could have stopped recognize it was a mosquito and say please drink all of my blood that's my favorite thing but no you whacked it and took it off this mortal coil premeditation doesn't have to be for a long period of time it could be the two seconds that took to smack the mosquito so i was like "Ooh, mosquito theory Okay, so the state prosecutor, the, the lady got up there. She's like, this was premeditation all day long. I was like, praise sister. I almost got the Holy Ghost because I absolutely agreed with her. She was like, additionally, he bragged about what he did. He bragged to his father. He bragged to the police. And then, oh, hang on, hang on. You know, the devil done got in my throat again. Hang on. She said, they arrested him on another charge. Finally, they were like, wait, the police buzzards are out here circling around and we found a body in the field that we could tie directly back to him. And so they were like, um, hey, crazy, come here, come here, come here, come here. We want to talk to you. And he was like, okay, um, hey, Popo, I'm willing to talk to y'all, but first I'm going to need a burger and fries. Really? That's all it took? I don't know what meal I would request to give the police information. Also, I hope I'm never in that situation to try and have to figure it out. Oh, do they have key lime pie down there at the jail? But whatever. He um needed, he wanted burger and fries. So he's like, if you get me a burger and fries, I'll tell you everything. And they were like, okay, great. So they got him a burger and fries. I'm dying to know what his order was. Did he get in and out? Did he get the seasoned fries, waffle fries? Did he go for some of them tater tots? Unclear. Anyway, they got him a burger and fries. And then they were like, we are pressing record right now. Boop. Okay. Tell us everything. So, oh, and he commenced to talk a child. I know about that talking too much life. So anyway, he told them everything. And you know, that recording that they played in court that we could not hear at all. Even if you put on your best, best listening ears, you had no idea what it said. Well, apparently the prosecutor, well, she had on her listening ears. She also had a transcript, which was probably very helpful. And so she decoded this tape for us. And I was like, Oh, apparently what he said was he picked this girl from the bar. He went home from, went home with her. She fell asleep and she's just laying there sleeping. He's like, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to take her off this mortal coil. And so he commits to hugging her real tight around her neck. Um, but according to the autopsy, she fought and scratched and it was a fight to the unalive. But, um, 
he won. And so he unfortunately unalived her. He couldn't move her back. Then he just laid there waiting. Like, did you just hang it out? You just, you do this thing and you just hanging out? So rude. Plus, you don't know her. How you just gonna hang out at her house like that? But I guess if you are out here in these streets, unfortunately, unaliving people, you're really, really not that concerned with manners. That is just an observation I'm making for myself. Hang on. Oh, I talk my throat dry. Hang on, hang on. So he says the first lady, he just did it because, like, this will be interesting. Then he um stole her car drove over to Mila's, got into a fight with Mila, assaulted her weave, pulled it all out. Remember, I told you he punched her in the nose. It was tumbleweave blowing down the street. The whole thing was a situation. And he said on tape, I would have unfortunately unalived Mila, but it was too many people around. Sarah, sir, see, I told y'all, no manners. Then the police pulled him over for like battery on Mila's weave. And then um, he was like, nope, getting out of here. And screech tires. And he went away. While he was driving away, he just saw a lady walking down the street. And he was like, hey, can you tell me where the school is? And she's like, it's right up there. You can't miss it. He's like, I drove past her twice and I couldn't see it. Can you show me? So she got in the car. Ma'am, stranger danger. So they're driving and they're just chitty, chitty, chat, chatting. And he was just like, you know what I'm going to do? I've already, unfortunately, unalived one person, so why not try it again? So she went to get out of the car, and he commits to, like, choking her, but he wasn't good at it because he was he was um, distracted because he was also driving. Some tells me his hands were not attended to. Do you just go straight at 12 o'clock when you're trying to do something with the other hand? I don't know how all that works. But anyway, it took him two or three times of choking her. She'd pass out and come back and pass out and come back. Horrific. And so finally, once she was passed out, he threw her in front of the car and then ran over her a bunch of times, then threw her body in the field. He's a horrific human being. And he talked about it. He bragged about it. He gave all these details and was very animated telling the police about it three days after the crime, long after his little flocka had worn off or whatever else. And so the uh, state was like, drugs are no defense in this case. Long after those drugs were out of his system, he was still all just running his mouth. And let's don't even get started about the tattoos. Did you notice that everybody who got on the stand who had to describe them, they didn't say the dude with the whole tattooed up face. No, they were like, the gentleman in the black tie. Are we just not gonna talk about the elephant in the room? His whole, he's a person of color, bright technicolor on that one side of his face. Oh, he has words, he has phrases, might be a riddle in there. There's a swastika under his eye. What is happening? Honestly, I believe that the tattoos prejudiced him before before the jury, but also him being a horrific human being also prejudiced him before the jury. And so I was just like, okay, th this is what we're doing. Obviously, he's going to be convicted. It's pretty clear he's going to be convicted. So the state made an impassionate plea to like, Please convict him. He's clearly terrible. Do you want him in your regular community? No, he's a horrible human being. Send him to prison forever. And honestly, she had a point. And so the judge was like, thank you everyone for your arguments. Oh, he was so calm. I was like, oh, hey, your honor, you must see a lot of crazy things. Also, the bailiff with the faces. Now, listen, we talked about the bailiff with the resting surprise face. I would be remiss if I did not include an entire carousel of pictures of bailiff resting surprise face at the end of this video. So please stay tuned for that because, oh, I have many, many, the many faces of bailiff resting surprise face. He was surprised by this trial and he showed us with his face every single chance he got. He was like, just like, it was crazy. I loved every minute of it. So anyway, um, Wade Wilson is sitting there and he's just like, not a care in the world, just calm, easy breezy, cool as you please. And I was like, okay, sir, I don't, I'm not, mm -mm, mm -mm. you're not right. You're not right in the hat. But I think it's pretty clear that the jury can see that too. And the jury will probably make their decision out here in the hallway. They're not even going to have to be gone that long. Um, they were out for two hours. I can't believe it took them two hours. But I've decided that the first hour was them just sort of like reading through everything. The second hour, was that lunch? Did y'all bring in the lunch? And they were just like, okay, so we're going to wait till lunch gets here because who are we to pass up a free meal? So they got their free meal and that, okay, who votes guilty? Everybody, okay, we can go back in there. So they voted guilty and then they came back and they're like, your honor. And when they came back, when the jury had a verdict, now listen, I watch all these body language YouTube people 
And while Wade Wilson looked calm, looked serene, his face looked like everything is fine. I'm completely unbothered. He's like, if you look up unbothered in the dictionary, you will see a picture of me. Let me tell you something. That is not true. Because if you watch him, and you know, I watch everything on 2X because my whole life, my brain, everything works on 2X. He was breathing really fast. Like, <sighs> I was like, okay. <clears throat> oh, goodness. I was like, you're obviously going to be found guilty. You know what I know what everybody in here knows it. The judges told everybody, don't freak out. Everybody calm down. I know there's emotion on both sides. Both sides of what? It's only one side of this. He did it. Team, he get, he's guilty. Team, he did it. That's every single body in this courtroom, except for possibly him. Even his lawyers know he did it. So, okay. So they were like, mm-hmm. He said, breathe it real heavy. And with every char charge, they were like, mm-hmm. He did that. He's a mess. But wait. After he um, was, after he unalived the ladies and he was running from the police, he broke into somebody's house and he stole some food and clothes and whatever. They were like, you are guilty of, of unfortunately unalive in the first degree, assault, a deadly assault on a weave, unfortunately unalive in the second degree, breaking and entering and stealing a sandwich. I was like, it cracks me up that they threw in the baloney charge. They're like, mm-mm. Them white white claws and baloney. We in Florida must protect our alcohol and luncheon meat. And so, sir, you have also been convicted of assault of on a, a baloney sandwich with some cheese. I don't know if it was baloney. I just made that part up. But he did drink that lady's alcohol because we saw the empty bottles. So anyway, he got convicted, and then they went and they took his fingerprints or whatever. And I was like, oh, this trial is over. Can they just adjudicate him guilty right now and then send him off? But no there's going to be a penalty phase and they expect the penalty phase to last for two days. Oh, but you know, I'm going to be here for the penalty phase, right? Oh, I love a penalty phase because then I think that's when these defense attorneys are really going to shine. I think they were keeping their powder dry so that they could come back and be like, okay, because they were talking about a mitigation expert. They were like, we are waiting for the court to approve our funds for our mitigation expert. And I'm like, what mitigation could you possibly have now he mentioned flocka which by the way i'm not sure what words i can say here on the tubes of you you know how it goes so i'm gonna give you i'm gonna explain to you what particular narcotics um this gentleman was using they called it flocka and i was like what is flocka flocka is a combination of heroin and uh methamphetamine i don't i don't know what you can say it's meth and heroin. So um, I said it quickly and towards the end of the video. So um, hopefully the little algorithm or whatever. Al, leave me alone. Mr. Go Rhythm, mm -mm. I, I, I'm not doing my business. I'm over here just trying to make video. So anyway, um, I think they're going to use the Flocka defense. Like he was on Flocka and so you cannot blame him. Also, he was adopted. I expect to be, there to be information about his childhood and how um, his mama didn't love him enough or she loved him too much or he was left-handed or he was right-handed. Like something crazy. I fully, fully expect there to be something crazy. And the psychological component of this trial is what is fascinating to me. Also, the gossipy part of it. I want to know all about his mama who had him when she was 13 or 14. The daddy who was all also 13 or 14. I didn't even know a 14 year old male could impregnate a girl, but okay, clearly you can because that's what happened in this case. He was born to very, very young teen parents, adopted as a baby to some nice people from down at the church. Are his parents going to testify? His biological father testified, but is his, are his adoptive parents going to testify? They say he also has siblings where his sisters are. Oh, I want to hear from everybody in the family, everybody, but that's not going to be till next week. In the meantime, we have to figure out what we're gonna cover next we will work it out together members us over there in the back room we're gonna come up with a plan for what to cover next you know there is always some ridiculous mama luke out here doing some crimes and so i will be here to cover it like i am want to do in the meantime don't forget to like this video subscribe to this channel and please stay tuned for the parade of crazy faces from a bailiff resting surprise face until then i'll see you tomorrow bye